Good evening and welcome to our midweek Bible study here at Malvern Hill Baptist Church. I'm so glad that you could join with us. We have had a good week here. Things are still continuing to go well at the church and I am grateful for the way that you all have been so incredibly faithful. I'm also happy to, to, to tell you that based on a few stories I'm hearing from other churches uh, across our state and across our region, we're not the only church that is seeing God bless in some pretty incredible ways during this time. Several churches and pastors with whom I've spoke have, have seen similar patterns in giving that we've had with giving being on the increase. Um, I'm happy to report to you that for the most part our, our, our congregation is still healthy as far as I know and things are going well. We had a really good Sunday morning service here in the parking lot. Um, we had uh, actually about 50% more vehicles here than we had just the, the week before, and that continues to be a, a joy for most of our folks who were able to participate. I'd like to give you just a few updates about what it's going to look like for us moving forward in the next few weeks here at Malvern Hill as we continue to honor our governor's request for social distancing. If you're paying attention to the news, you will know that there, um, there are some relaxing or there is some relaxing beginning to happen of those social distancing policies. Uh, just today, I was um, allowed to be a part of a, a video conference that our governor participated in with South Carolina Baptist pastors. There he had some, uh, some instruction, really, really requests, not instruction. Our governor honors and respects the Constitution and the First Amendment in particular, and as a result is not issuing directives for how it is that churches should function. But he is asking us to continue to honor the social distancing guidelines that have been set in place by our uh, Department of Health and Environmental Control as well as the CDC. So we at Malvern Hill are going to continue to do that for the time being and for the immediate future. We will continue to observe social distancing measures by meeting in our parking lot for those sorts of worship services uh, in, in, for the immediate future. Now, how long is that going to go on? I don't know. We just don't know. And I just want to be honest with you about that. We're going to continue to do all that we can to try and resource and equip you. We're going to do all that we can to try to create opportunities for you all to worship or even to have some fellowship moving forward, even though those times of fellowship will certainly be unique and different as we try to create distance. It's going to be uh, times in the future maybe where there's going to be air high fives and, and, and speaking from across the yard and, and maybe not being able to be as close to one another as we would like, but we want to continue to do all that we can to provide ministry resources for you. I do want to also remind you that in addition to the efforts we're having for parking lot services, we're continuing to try to fill up uh, our YouTube channel and our social media channels, our website with resources for you. Uh, the video, Kevin posted a video yesterday that he and Deanna worked on just for all of you who are uh, trying to figure out e-learning at home but aren't used to homeschooling, sort of how to, how to practice homeschooling without losing your mind. So that's up there. Uh, I posted a podcast yesterday with uh, the vice president of the International Mission Board, or one of the vice presidents of the International Mission Board, helping us to learn about um, how his experience on the International Mission Board uh, as, as a missionary in, a foreign, in foreign countries can, can help to really inform the way that we respond during these times of global pandemic, but also to hear some really good things coming from the field that our missionaries across the world are continuing to serve and, and, and the, the, the need that they have for our prayers as we, as we lift them up and, and encourage them. So uh, those things are available as well as um, our services that continue to be available online. They will continue to be available online. I know that many of you are not able or maybe don't feel comfortable even being a part of our parking lot services, but you're able to continue to enjoy those at home through our YouTube channel, and uh, that will continue to be the case. We're actually increasing our technology capabilities really weekly right now to make sure that uh, regardless of how long this, this continues, we're able to continue to resource and equip you in, in every way that we can imagine. So please know that we're doing all we can to get you the things that we can. Uh, we're looking forward to the days when this will be behind us, but until then, uh, we can't allow perfect to be the enemy of good enough, and uh, we, we, we've been good enough for a while. We're trying to make sure that our good enough continues to get a little bit better, and maybe at some point we'll have all this perfected. Uh, my hope will be, though, that before we get it all perfected, that we'll actually be able to begin coming back together with one another and enjoying worship and enjoying fellowship in the way that, uh, that we were designed to do and that we long for. And I think it's important, we've talked about that a little bit on Wednesday nights, it's important for us to remember that what we miss is that which we were designed to enjoy. God created us for relationship. 
So when you long for those relational encounters, when you long to see each other and to, to love on each other, to enjoy one another, it, it's, it's not a worldly longing, okay? It, it is something that was instilled in you from your creator. God created us as relational beings, and the longer this thing lingers, the more we long for the day when we can respond to one another personally and, and not just communicate over video chats and phone calls and text messages. So I look forward to those days, but until that comes, I'm so glad that we have this medium through which we can communicate. And I'm so thankful to be your pastor. I thank you for all the encouragement that I continue to receive from you. I thank you for the way that you're supporting your church and caring well for one another. Uh, just an encouragement to you. If you have needs, uh, reach out to your life group leaders. They want to know that. They want to care for you and help you. Reach out to your deacons. Reach out to us as your pastors. Let us know what we can do to help you and, and, and to minister to you. I do want to remind you that we have a food bank, a food pantry here. That's it's an emergency food pantry. If you yourself have needs or if you know someone who has needs, please let us know. Our food pantry is well stocked. As a matter of fact, it's so stocked right now. What I'm going to say to you is, is uh, we don't need any more just now. If you um, had, had already collected things that you were hoping to give to us, I would encourage you to give that to the United Way. They could maybe make more immediate use of it, but right now our food pantry is as full as I've ever known it to be. So we do not need you, and, and that's because y'all, by the way, have just sh showed up in such an incredible way. Some of you just showed up with truckloads of stuff, and, and I appreciate that. All right, uh, we're going to be in the book of 1 John tonight for just a few minutes. 1 John chapter 5. Uh, I want to speak just a little bit about what it is to, to be as a Christian during these days and maybe address what uh, could potentially become uh, a struggle for many churches. I don't expect it to be a struggle for us, but a struggle for many churches and many Christians as we face life in the coming weeks, as we move from what some government officials have, have called phase one to phase two, when we begin to ease these social distancing restrictions and move back into some semblance of normal as we await the time when we can actually get into a full normal routine. So anyway, we're going to be in 1 John chapter 5. I'm going to begin reading in verse 1. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that has overcome the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? Can I pray for you real quick? Father God, I pray that this word would be powerful in our lives today. That as we enjoy it together uh, over the internet, Lord God, as we sit separated in our homes and enjoy this word, I pray, God, that we would be united by your spirit, united by your word, and united by the truths that it will teach us. But Father God, I pray that we cling to your word, not just for the truths that we may learn, but for the God that we know better as we enjoy this word. I pray that it would challenge us, change us, Father God, and Lord God, that it would work to make us over into your image more and more every day. I pray that as a result of this time, we would love you and love others more. That, Father God, we would look different than the world because we are spending time with you. In Jesus' name, amen. One of the things that, uh, that, that is going to come on the back end of this is, is a realization that you don't even maybe know yet because your, your interaction with people is so limited. You might not be aware just how wide the range of reaction is to the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, I, I think that there are, are three big benchmarks that we see here along this, um, this spectrum and there's a lot of place in between. So on, on one end, on, on one extreme end, we have those people that, that say, you know what, let's just put all this behind us, open everything up, and come what may, we'll just move forward. That, that, that's one end. On, on, on another end, we have those people who are really afraid of what could come and who are urging and begging that, that restrictions not be lifted for a long while, that everybody stay home and keep your distance. And then somewhere in the middle, I like to think is the wisest place, mostly because that's where I am. Uh, somewhere in the middle, we have uh, those folks who, who are saying coronavirus is a very real threat. 
uh, but at the same time, the economic depression that we're looking at is a very real threat. The, 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 the risks to mental health and the risks to many other things is a very real threat. And so though coronavirus is a real threat, we've got to find a way to work back into normal life. Now, I don't know where all of you fall on that spectrum, but here's what I know. I know because I, like the rest of you, am biased by my own perspective and my own opinions. I tend to believe that everybody thinks and believes sort of the same way that I do until I actually speak to people. What I'm finding is that I am in one camp, some other people are in another camp, and other people on the other end of that spectrum. And, and regardless of where they are, we're going to have a lot of people within that spectrum, even within our own congregation. And even if they're not in our own congregation, we're going to see that spectrum of, of, of struggle, of belief, of, of concern in the lives of Christians all across our country in the coming days and weeks. Okay? The same things that we're seeing politically are going to be played out in the pews of our churches. It's, it's going to come as some people and some churches struggle making decisions about if and when, well, obviously not an if, but about when they will open up their doors and welcome people in and what that's going to look like. And as they begin to wrestle through that, there's going to be those people who believe that they should hold off and not do anything for a long while. There's going to be others that say, why haven't we already opened the doors? And then again, there's going to be that middle perspective that's trying uh, to figure out and, 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 and listen to government guidance and trying to make a decision based upon those things. Okay, um, What do we do as believers? What do I do if I find myself in a conversation with somebody who disagrees with me 110%? What if I am utterly convinced that we should not open the doors of the church until we have uh, a, a, a vaccine for this virus, whether that's in two months or in 18 months, and I find myself in a conversation with somebody who says we should have opened the doors two weeks ago, what do we do in that moment? The first thing I think it's important that we recognize that as, as Christians and as human beings, just because we disagree doesn't mean that we have to hate one another. This is the ugliness of the political world in which we find ourselves living today. Democrats and Republicans can't even engage in conversations in the public sphere because they have to be uh, in such opposition. It reminds me of professional wrestling. I watched professional wrestling a lot when I was a kid. And you had the good guys and you had the bad guys. And, and they couldn't even pretend to get along, but occasionally... Uh, you would see uh, the unintentional camera shot of the guys that are just having a casual conversation in the background. But they had to put on this public persona of, of hating one another. We're seeing that lived out in the political world that, that we occupy right now with this, this need to, to live completely in one camp or the other. What I, I want to urge us to remember is that if we find ourselves in disagreement, whether it's over the coronavirus or over global warming, over whether or not somebody should drive five miles under the speed limit or five miles over the speed limit, or whether or not a Chevy, a Ford, or a Dodge is the best route to go, regardless of what it is we find ourselves in a disagreement about, I want us to be reminded that as, as Christians, we have a responsibility first and foremost in our relationship with one another to love one another. And that's where I think this takes us to the book of 1 John and what God has to say to us about what we are to be as Christians. Now, we like to say here at Malvern Hill that we love God, love others, and seek to change the world. And, and I want that to be our rally cry today, tomorrow, and into the future. The, the, the coronavirus pandemic doesn't change our marching orders as believers, okay? We do not stop loving God, loving others, and seeking to change the world. This may affect the way that we do some of those things for a period of time, but it doesn't change what we're trying to do, okay? It doesn't change our goal. But as Christians, right here in 1 John, we're, we're reminded that Christians are to love God, love one another. Um, they obey God's commandments, and then they overcome the world. Now, when we find ourselves disagreeing with one another, the first thing we need to come back to is the thing that unites us. And the thing that unites us more than anything is our love for the Lord. As Christians, we may disagree about a lot of things. We may disagree about when we come back to worship. We may disagree about the styles of worship that we engage with. We may disagree about how we dress for worship. Some of you are going to have a hard time putting a shirt and tie on to come back to church because you haven't done that in, in so many weeks by the time we walk back in the door. We may disagree about all those other things, but the thing that has to unite us first and foremost is that we love the Lord our God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. The thing that has to unite us is a reminder that we are brothers and sisters in Christ, that we've been purchased with the same blood, that on the cross of Calvary, Jesus died 
for all of us, and if we are followers of Jesus, that unites us. Okay, Regardless of what may seek to divide us, those things that would seek to divide us must never arise to a place where we allow the devil to get a foothold. Just because I disagree with you doesn't mean I hate you. Just because I disagree with you on one thing doesn't mean I disagree with you on everything. Just because I disagree with you doesn't make me wrong. Certainly doesn't make me your enemy. Likewise, it doesn't make me right. You understand, when we are dealing with things, especially something like a coronavirus pandemic that we have so little understanding of, it's important for us to approach it with a degree of humility, with a reminder that I have an opinion, but my opinion is based off of what I've read or my experiences. When I interview, oh, well, I don't interview anybody, but if I speak to somebody that's a, an emergency room doctor, their experience is very different even than a general practitioner. Because they're seeing two different things. And, and we need to remember that's true not even related to coronavirus. If I speak with a trauma doctor in, in, a, in a large hospital system, their experience is constantly seeing people who have experienced major trauma, major physical trauma in their life. And yet, and yet general practitioners rarely see that. They're both doctors. They both have important roles to play. But what they see shades the world or, or, or the way that they experience the world. Okay? And so understand that as I figure out how I'm going to respond to something like a pandemic, my experiences are coloring and shading the world. And the person with whom I'm speaking may have different experiences of coloring and shading their world. Right? So I walk into these things first with a reminder as I'm speaking with a brother, and si a brother or sister in Christ that that's exactly who they are. They're my brother or sister in Christ. And the thing that has to unite us is not an agreement over tertiary things, but an agreement over the thing that matters more than anything, and that is that we love the Lord with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. So Christians love the Lord first. Second, the first John says that Christians love one another. Everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of Him. Okay? One of the ways that we can navigate disagreement and difficult conversations is to remember that the person that I'm looking at in these conversations, especially when it's a brother or sister in Christ, is a person that I love. I don't love them even because I want to love them. I love them because I'm commanded to love them. Now, it's my hope and prayer that you love them because you want to. But understand, sometimes we choose to love somebody because we are commanded to love them. We may enjoy loving them later, but in the, in the moment, we are commanded to love them. It's important that we speak of one another often as brothers and sisters in Christ. My brothers and I often disagree. We have been known to disagree about things that have large significance in our lives. We've been known to disagree loudly. Some of y'all would call that an argument. We don't generally do that. Uh, but, but we disagree with one another. But the thing that never changes is that once we finish whatever conversation we had, we never forget that, that, is, that we're brothers. There's never been a time when I had a, a conversation with either of my brothers when I thought, well, this is somebody that I don't know and that probably hates my guts. No, they're my brother. And as a result of that, I know that they love me and I love them. We may disagree, but my love for them never changes. Y'all, I want to urge you that as, as we begin to weave our way back into whatever the, some de degree or semblance of normalcy looks like, I want you to remember especially as you're engaging with other Christians, that you're engaging with those who are... who. <coughs> this is one of the reasons I hate videoing live, because we don't get to edit that out. Uh, but remember that we are, you are engaging with that person who you are commanded by the Lord to love, and a person who's commanded to love you. So I want to encourage you. Now, whether that disagreement comes this week or next week or in the coming months as related to this, or if your disagreement's over something else. What if your disagreement's over a theological issue? Or your disagreement is over exactly how it is that your pastor should preach? Or your disagreement's over what time the church should meet? Can you remember in those days that that's your brother or your sister in Christ? You love them and they love you, and that should color your conversation. Not only that, but those who, uh, who love the Lord, those who are followers of Jesus... They keep the commandments of God. Well, he's commanded you to love him. He's commanded you to, to, to love your brother or your sister. Okay, So if you're a follower of Jesus, you keep those commandments. You say, but Craig, that's hard. You know how annoying that person is. I mean, I, I, I hear that at my own house sometimes. I've got four kids, right? And every once in a while, well, I mean, let's be honest, most days somebody is accused of being annoying in my house. And, 
And that happens even as adults. You say, Craig, you want me to love them, but how in the world can I love them? Well, that's exactly what John writes to this church that he's writing to. He says, you've overcome the world. Those who love God have overcome it. And when he talks about overcoming, he then uh, goes on to to explain that, that we have overcome through Jesus who has overcome on our behalf. This idea of overcoming is a reminder that as a follower of Jesus, we've been given his Holy Spirit, okay? And through that Holy Spirit, we've actually been given the ability to resist temptation. The Bible says if we resist the devil, he'll flee from us, all right? We have the, the ability to resist temptation. So God does an amazing thing. He gives us commandments and expectations. He then says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. But then he goes on and he says, oh, by the way, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. But I've actually created a scenario to make it possible for you to keep my commandments. It's as though God says it's going to cost you this much money, but here's the money that you need to actually get it taken care of, right? God's given us the tools, and the tools that we have, the most important tool that we could ever imagine, His Holy Spirit lives within us. Jesus has overcome on our behalf, and as a result of His work on the cross, He's made it possible for us to overcome temptation and sin in our life and then he's given us his holy spirit so that we might live in the power and strength of the holy spirit of god disagreements are normal it's a part of life i'm working through marriage counseling with some couples right now that that, that we're getting married they're, they're going to get be getting married during the pandemic i mean this is just a reality that these these young kids are facing and yet during uh one of the things that we talk a lot about in marriage counseling is is the reality of disagreement not, not a warning uh, to, uh, to avoid disagreement. We, we do all we can to do that, but just a reality of disagreements. Healthy couples disagree. And it's often during those disagreements they actually can grow in intimacy with one another if they'll remember that the person with whom they're disagreeing is their spouse. It's somebody that they love. Y'all, disagreements are a normal part of people living in close community with one another. Uh, here at Malvern Hill, one of the things we like to talk a lot about is we use the word family, we use the word community, we talk about being a community of faith, and, and we don't do that as, as, as some way to speak with newfangled uh, terminology for the 21st century. I want to make sure that we clearly communicate that a church is that. It is, a, it is a community of people who lean upon one another and lean upon the Lord. They live life together, they love together, they, they, they win together, they lose together, they succeed together, they fail together, and in the midst of all of that, one of the byproducts of close community is going to be the fact that somebody's going to get on your nerves. Somebody's going to do something that you don't appreciate. You're going to do something they don't like. And as a result, there's going to be disagreement. Y'all, when we find ourselves in those places of disagreement, let's be reminded, we love the Lord first. And that's what actually unites us, okay? That's, that's the common denominator there. The second thing is we love one another because God's commanded us to do so. Uh, the third thing is that those who love the Lord actually keep his commandments. And he has commanded us to love him and to love our neighbor so we don't have a choice. And then finally, we can be encouraged to know that even though God's commanded us to do all those, all those things, he's actually overcome the world on our behalf. He's given us the tools, the most important things that we need to actually be able to follow him, to obey him. Jesus died and freed us from the power of sin. Jesus sent his Holy Spirit to enable us to live for him. And in the process of all that, we actually get to love one another. We get to move on beyond the disagreements and the struggles we have with one another. And it doesn't matter if we're talking about coronavirus or we're talking about theological issue or we're talking about the color of the carpet in the sanctuary. It doesn't matter if you're on this end of the spectrum or that end of the spectrum. If you're in the middle of the spectrum, you can actually sit down with one another. Some people who are really afraid of this coronavirus others who are not very concerned at all and then those people that are in the middle that are going hey it's a reality but we got to learn to live with it do you know that we can all coexist in the same place because we love the lord we love one another we keep his commandments and he's given us all the things we need to honor and and, and accept those commandments so i want to encourage you to do that um uh, social media is is uh maybe i'm wrong okay so so brace yourself i could be wrong but if i'm not we're going to see social media become a really toxic place in the next few weeks. It already is a lot of times, but in the next few weeks, as, as, uh, as governors continue to make decisions about opening up and, and relaxing things, there's going to be those people that are screaming and jumping up and down on social media, warning that this is going to be the end of the world. Um, I saw they're, they're using the word apocalypse in some, uh, in, in some um, news media right now, which blows my mind. Um, we're going to have others that are they're going to be jumping up and down going, I've got to get back to work and my kids are going to be hungry and I've got to pay my rent. And then there's going to be others in the middle. Can, can I just urge you in, in, in those times, the best thing that we can do is probably keep our mouths shut and engage in conversation with one another face to face or over the phone or over a video chat and do so in love and care and grace. Okay, Jesus loves us and we're not lovable. 
okay, period. And the people that disagree with us are still lovable in some way. We've got to remember that we don't accept the cultural mandate that we must hate those people that disagree with us. We are a different sort of community, a different culture. We are a culture that's been shaped by the blood of Jesus Christ. And as a result, we don't hate those who disagree with us. We love them instead, and we find a way to coexist and to love one another and to, 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 to work together in a community that honors and loves Jesus Christ. Again, thank you so much for being a part of our, our church whether you're a uh, first-time visitor with us on this pod, or not a podcast, on this, um, this, this video, or whether you've been with us every step of the way during this pandemic, or whether you've been with us for the last 13, 15, or 25 years, regardless of what stage of the journey you're in with us at Malvern Hill, we're glad to have you, and we look forward to the day when we can all be together again. Uh, just a reminder, we do have a prayer call in the morning at 9.15. For those of you that can participate, I'll make sure that we get an email out with instructions about that today. Uh, we have Sunday morning worship here in the parking lot at 1030. Tomorrow night at 6, our students have a Zoom call so they can interact with one another. But again, thank you so much for being who you are and for the way that you love me, you love our church, and most importantly, you love the Lord. Y'all continue to do what you're supposed to do. Continue to love Jesus and continue to find ways to thrive during these difficult days. Have a good week.